Okay, everybody. Uh, you've got James Mayer and Travis Wofford here with uh, the Houston office of Baker Botts. Um, uh, I'm a I'm a partner in the in the corporate department, and Travis is senior associate. Uh, for any questions uh, during or after the program, please email Andrew Scott at andrew.scott at bakerbots.com. Uh, that's a n d r e w dot s c o t t at bakerbots dot com. And just to let you know, this program has been approved for CLE credit in Texas, California, and New York. That's for one hour. And a recording of the webinar will be circulated in the next few days, and will also be posted to the firm website at www bakerbots.com. I think we have a uh, timely topic today as we get uh, close to the uh, uh, second quarter, to the close of the second quarter of 2016. So we'll get right into it. Uh, we'll start off with a brief overview of uh, non-GAAP measure history, and then we'll do a quick refresher on um, Reg G requirements overall, and after that, we'll probably get into uh, what will be the most interesting subject for many, which is unpacking the new CDNIs. So, uh, recent remarks by the SEC have given a number of warnings about the SEC's renewed focus on non GAAP measure presentations. SEC Chair Mary Jo White said in December of 2015, this area deserves close attention, both to make sure that its current rules are being followed and to ask whether they are sufficiently robust in light of current market practices. And then more recently, there have been a couple comments from um, Mark Cronforce, the Chief Accountant of the Division of Corporation Finance. Uh, he said, for, back of, for lack of a better way to say it, we are going to crack down. The pendulum has swung. And then perhaps even more ominously, he said, this next quarter will be a great opportunity for companies to self-correct. So, uh, so with those uh, not too subtle warnings, companies are now on notice. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, at, shortly after that, sort of the hammer came down with the revised compliance and disclosure interpretations that were published on May 17, 2016. Just a, a, a brief history of uh, how we got to here. In the years leading up to the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and in connection with the corporate failures that surrounded, uh, surrounded the adoption of that law, there was a lot of focus uh, by the SEC and others on certain financial measures that companies were, were using, which uh, at the time were, were often called pro forma financial measures. Um, but then the, uh, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed in 2002, and in 2003, the SEC adopted new rules for it, what it called non-GAAP measure disclosures, which rules included Regulation G and Item 10E of Regulation SK. And then uh, after that, uh, uh, significantly in 2009, a, uh, the SEC brought its first enforcement act under Reg G uh, against a company called SafeNet, and that uh, action included a $1 million fine against the company, and the CFO of that company was barred from being a public company officer and director for five years. Um, that, I think, was a pretty considered a pretty egregious case, and it involved what the SEC likes to call earnings management. But uh, I think it's instructive as, as to you know what the potential penalties can be as uh, as we go through what the requirements are. Then in uh, June 2010, the SEC updated the CDIs for non-GAAP measures, and uh, at the time that was viewed as somewhat of a relaxation of the SEC's focus on Reg G, uh, and we'll get into in a, in a bit what those did, but. Uh, uh, you know, those updates at the time were, were relatively narrow, but, but now we know 
uh, with the uh, the new update that was just published last month that, as Mr. Conforce said, the, the pendulum has swung back for sure. Travis, do you want to take us through the, the basics of Reg G? Happy to. Um, so, kind of taking a step back so we can frame the discussion, uh, and for those of you who may be newer to uh, the non-GAAP rules, you, your first question might be, what's a non-GAAP measure, a uh, financial measure, and how am I going to notice it in a roadshow or earnings release or my 10Q or something like that? Um, so Reg G defines a non-GAAP financial measure as a numerical measure of past or future financial performance financial position or cash flows that uh, either excludes an amount that's included in the most directly comparable gap measure or includes an amount that was excluded from the most, com uh, most comparable gap measure. Uh, in the adopting release, the SEC also expressly said that it intends to include measures that have the effect of depicting either a performance measure that's different from the ones in the financial statements, or a liquidity measure that's different from what's in your statement of cash flows, uh, specifically the cash flow or cash flow from operations. Um, they, they also had a couple exclusions uh, from what is uh, a non-GAAP measure. That's uh, financial measures that are calculated in accordance with GAAP, obviously. Um, financial information that doesn't have the effect of providing numerical measures that are different from the comparable gap measure, um, and then operating measures or other measures that are not non-gap financial measures. And so the examples they give here are unit sales, number of employees, uh, and the like. So some common non-gap financial measures are EBIT, EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, CAFD, DCF, uh, free cash flow, FFO, um, and then measures of operating income that exclude non-recurring items. Um, and then we've got on the slide a couple examples of things that are not non-GAAP financial measures. So now that we've actually figured out what is a non-GAAP financial measure, the question is, what is it that Reg G requires us to do? Um, most of you are already familiar with these requirements, so we'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, the idea here is uh, whenever a registrant, let me remove this. A registrant or a person acting on its behalf that's your investment bankers or the like, publicly discloses material information that includes a non-GAAP financial measure. You need to accompany it with the most directly comparable GAAP financial measure and a reconciliation to that GAAP measure. So you might say, well, what does it mean if it's publicly disclosed? Does that mean it has to be filed with the SEC? Uh, no, this covers things that are not filed with the SEC. Well, what, what if I'm doing a roadshow? Does that get caught up in this? Well, if, if it's a roadshow you do that Reg FD requires you to furnish to the SEC, then yes, definitely. Uh, there's a little bit of gray area on some roadshows, whether or not it's been sufficiently widely distributed to be uh, public or not. That's uh, kind of a facts and circumstances question. Um, so what is this reconciliation that the SEC actually requires? So that they typically expect for performance measures that you're going to reconcile to net income or income from continuing operations uh, that are shown on the income statement. And then for liquidity measures, uh, reconciliation to amounts from the statement of cash flows. So again, cash flows from operating, investing, and finance activities. Uh, this Reg G is not limited to written statements. This includes oral statements. So if you go out and have an earnings call or a webcast, um, that would be picked up by the requirements of Reg G. Uh, it also picks up non-GAAP financial measures that you present on your website. Uh, 
Uh, so for those of you that have any oversight on that, you want to be sure that you're actually scrubbing the disclosures of your Mountain Gap financial measures on the website. Um, for oral statements, just an FYI, you can satisfy your Reg G uh, requirements under 100A, which are the uh, reconciliation and presentation of the gap measure. Uh, if the required information is on the registrant's website and the website address is provided in the same presentation. So that's what's required to be disclosed. What is prohibited? Uh, rule 100B looks a lot like 10B5. Uh, and it says a registrant or again the person acting on its behalf shall not make a public make public a non-GAAP financial measure that taken together with the information accompanying that measure uh, and any other accompanying discussion of that measure again this goes back to your earnings calls uh, and other discussions on a roadshow or the like contain an untrue statement of a material fact or omit to state a material fact necessarily necessary in order to make the presentation of the non-GAAP financial measure in light of the circumstances under which it's presented, not misleading. So, um, as we can, and this is a big, will be one of the big focuses of the new CDIs when we when we get to that. Right, and it's it's when you look at these CDIs, you should remember that when, the way that they're phrased is um, a set of examples that may be misleading. So, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you're complying with this specific rule, and the SEC is giving guidance on certain examples that may, uh, in their uh, opinion, be misleading. And as always, 10b-5 liability may also apply, uh, which brings along the private right of action and the like. So we get to uh, 10e. This is applying to your SEC filings. So and if an SEC filing discloses a non-GAAP financial measure, you're going to have the same Reg G requirements of the reconciliation and then presenting the most directly comparable gap financial measure. But in these, you also have to present that directly comparable gap financial measure with equal or greater prominence. This is another item that is heavily covered in the CNDIs that we'll be talking about more later. Um, there are two other additional requirements. One is you have to provide the reasons why management believes the non-GAAP measure is useful uh, to investors uh, and to the extent material a statement disclosing any additional purposes. So one thing that the uh, staff has been harping on uh, over the last year is saying that people are presenting boilerplate usefulness disclosures and they don't like it, they're upset about it, and they Mark Cronfurst has said that that's something that people should look out for as being uh, a particular source of comment letters in the near future. So um, the, the other good thing about the usefulness disclosure, though, is to the extent that you're presenting a non-GAAP financial measure, um, that is a good way to give color to the SEC on why you're presenting it and why your particular presentation makes sense and is helpful for investors. Again, that's what's required, but you're kind of building your case in advance to the SEC. So uh, in addition to SEC filings, uh, don't forget that item 202 of Form 8K requires uh, these disclosures and connections with earnings releases furnished to the SEC. So what information is prohibited in SEC filings under 10E? Um, that's non-GAAP liquidity measures that exclude charges or liabilities that need to be cash settled. EBIT and EBITDA are expressly exempt from this particular prohibition. And then um, describing a non-GAAP performance measure um, adjustment as being non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual when in fact you've had that same adjustment in the last two years or it's reasonably likely that that's going to happen again or you'll have that same adjustment um, in the next two coming years. Um, just a reminder, this is on, this is a prohibition on describing the charger gain as 
non-recurring, infrequent, or unusual it is not a prohibition on actually making the adjustment. Um, but the SEC, uh, with, with a nice little cross-reference to their new misleading disclosures on the particular CDNI question 10203 that talks about this, they cross-reference back to, but by the way, this could still be misleading and therefore prohibited. So uh, other information prohibited by TINI in an SEC filing, these are the straightforward ones of you can't have a non-GAAP financial measure on the face of your GAAP financial statements or your pro forma financial information, and the title of the non-GAAP measure can't be confusingly similar or the same to your actual GAAP measures. Okay. Thanks, Travis. Um, so now we get into the new stuff, uh, the new CD&Is that were published last month. And those CD&Is began by reminding us that certain adjustments, although not explicitly prohibited, can result in a non-GAAP measure that is misleading and that violates Rule 100B of Regulation G, which, which Travis just covered. Uh, so I think, you know, what this is uh, or seems to be is a reminder that the, it's not just the bright line requirements of Reg G that have to be complied with, but also this, mis, this principle that uh, the measure itself shouldn't be misleading. And it appears that the staff believes that maybe more attention has been focused on, well, we're, we're providing the gap measure uh, along with the non-gap measure and we're doing the reconciliation, but, but they want people to uh, have in the back of their minds, I think, you know, is this, is this a measure that we ought to be using uh, to begin with, uh, or is it something that's potentially misleading? Uh, the CDNIs then proceed to give specific examples of non-GAAP measures that, uh, that may be misleading, such as presenting a performance measure that excludes normal recurring cash operating expenses necessary to operate a registrant's business. Uh, that's not uh, that's not a real earth-shattering one. Uh, also, a, a non-GAAP measure can be misleading if it's presented inconsistently between periods. Um, so, if a measure adjusts a particular charge or gain in the current period for which and and for which other similar charges or gains were not adjusted in prior periods, then unless you disclose the, the reasons for that change, that doing that could be misleading. And they go on to say even further that it may be necessary to recast prior measures to conform to the current presentation um, and, and place the disclosure in the appropriate context to, to avoid uh, being misleading. So I think the, uh, the takeaway is that the staff is, is looking for consistency there uh, across periods. And when you're, for example, working on an earnings release and and uh, and uh, looking at the non-GAAP measures that are used in that earnings release, it, you know you you have to think about prior periods and how and how the company's been presenting that measure or similar measures over time. And uh, this doesn't suggest that you can't necessarily tinker with those measures, but it may be necessary to at least explain, uh, in some cases, why you're doing that. Right. And, and I think to that point, kind of having transparency about what you're doing and, and why you're doing it, going back to this whole 100B misleading concept is, if you're disclosing why you're making the changes and what the changes are, then there's lots of an argument that you're misleading investors with your presentation of the measure. The next one is uh, that a, a non-GAAP measure can be misleading if it excludes charges but does not exclude any gains. That's another not particularly surprising one. And then uh, the next one is a, is a fact pattern which uh, the staff seem particularly focused on, uh, and that involves substituting individually ta tailored revenue recognition and uh, measurement methods for those of GAAP. And the question specifically was uh, with regards to 
whether you could have a, a non-GAAP performance measure that uh, is adjusted to accelerate revenue recognized rateably over time uh, uh, as though the revenue was earned when customers are billed. And the, the answer was no. Um, and uh, you know, I think in, in this case, the staff is really focused on the fact that this measure was sort of, you know, uh, uh, so contr you know, it was they're they're focused on revenue, you know, that that was the financial measure, uh, the gap line item, and 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 I think they didn't like the 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 fact that this measure was sort of redoing or, or reinventing gap on that on that particular uh, item. Um, but they also went on to say that other measures that use individually tailored recognition and me measurement methods for financial statement line items other than revenue may also be, be misleading. Uh, so I think, you know, one area where we're going to have to watch uh, the comment letters uh, to see uh, what happens is, is just how far the staff extends this, whether they remain focused on the on this particular revenue example or, or, you know, to what extent they extend it to other financial statement line items. But, uh, you know, at least now it's, it's, it's uh, something that uh, we have to watch out for that could, could be extended to other financial statement line items. Um, so the next one is on presentation of Kershaw <coughs> measures, particularly uh, liquidity measures. Uh, the SEC has said before, I think they're really putting down on paper here that they don't want to see the presentation of a per share liquidity measure. Um, what's interesting about the way that they've put this CNDI together is they really highlighted that they aren't interested in management's opinion of whether or not it's a performance measure or a liquidity measure. Um, so just kind of unpacking this quote here in the first sentence, they say, you know, it, it depends on whether the non-GAAP measure can be used as a liquidity measure. They say, even if management presents it solely as a performance measure. Then just to really drive the point home, they say when analyzing these questions, the staff is going to focus on the substance of the measure, not management's characterization. I love that. They're being real clear about what they're thinking here. Um, I, I, I think that um, this gets into the question of, you know, is something actually a liquidity measure? Can it actually be used as a liquidity measure? Well, you know, Brilliant minds may differ on exactly whether or not something can or cannot, um, but you have one approach that you can take, which is you present it in the aggregate as opposed to on a per share basis, and then in the same document, uh, for example, if it's a 10K or a 10Q, you have uh, the number of outstanding units or shares of the company. Um, or somebody in another disclosure would be able to go out and find that particular information and calculate on a per share basis. So um, a, an entrepreneurial financial analyst that's covering your stock is going to be able to determine what the liquidity measure would be on a per share basis. So you can get the information out without having to violate uh, the guidance of the SEC. I think it'll be interesting just to, this is another area where following the comment letters will be interesting just to see to what it, the SEC's opened the door to questioning some of these measures and, you know, what measures they actually uh, question and practice through the comment letters will be interesting to see and certainly informative. Right. And in and, and what industries and what, what types of companies, things like that. So um, the SEC was kind enough to give us a few examples. Uh, throughout the various CNDIs. So uh, the, the first one was free cash flow. They said free cash flow is a liquidity measure that must not be presented on a per share basis. So they, they were pretty clear about their feelings there. Um, EBIT and EBITDA, uh, even when they were discussing it in the context of being a performance measure, must not be presented on a per share basis. Um, interestingly, funds from operations, which is a common REIT uh, non-GAAP measure, they said depending on the nature of the adjustments may trigger the prohibition on presenting this measure uh, 
um, on a per share basis. Uh, and that's in part because one of their CNDIs uh, explicitly says that the National Association of REITs definition of, um, if, if you present consistently with their definition of SSO, then that will be a performance measure that the SEC is okay with you presenting on a per share basis. Uh, sorry, just to repeat, the FFO, uh, when presented in accordance with the definition uh, approved by the National Association of REITs, uh, the SEC in its CNDIs uh, has expressly stated they would consider that a performance measure that you can present on a per share basis. Um, uh, but just as a reminder here, they're not saying you're not allowed to present free cash flow or EBITDA anymore. They're just saying they don't want you to present it on a per share basis. Okay. All right, now getting into the CDIs on the, on the equal or greater prominence issue. Uh, the uh, staff gave uh, specific examples of disclosures of non-GAAP measures that uh, uh, that would be problematic. Um, you know, many of these specific matters are uh, really issues that I think securities lawyers have been concerned about before and talked uh, to their clients about ever since Reg G was adopted. But of course now, uh, you know, with these very specific on-point CDNIs, uh, you know, there's uh, there's sort of even less of an interpretational element uh, with respect to the equal or greater prominence requirement. The first one was presenting a full income statement of non-GAAP measures or presenting a full non-GAAP income statement when reconciling non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. Uh, the second is omitting comparable GAAP measures from an earnings release headline or caption that includes non-GAAP measures. Um, that, you know, that may be an area where some companies will have to uh, adjust how they do their, how they do their earnings releases. Uh, you know, it, I think it would also apply to uh, bullets as some, as some companies have. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's not good enough if in the text you, give equal or greater prominence to the uh, to the gap measure if you don't have the gap measure in the in the header or caption or bullets as it may be presenting a non gap measure using a style of presentation uh, such as bold or larger font that emphasizes the non gap measure over the comparable gap measure I'm not sure I've ever actually seen anybody attempt that one but uh, but point taken um, a non-GAAP measure that precedes the most uh, directly comparable GAAP measure, in, including in an earnings release headline or caption. Uh, so I think the message there is that order is very important. Uh, I think this is something that we've suspected for a while, but it clarifies that it's not good enough to have the GAAP measure just in general proximity. It really needs to be prior to the non-GAAP measure. <clears throat> Describing a non-GAAP measure as, for example, record performance or exceptional without an equally prominent descriptive characterization of the comparable GAAP measure. Uh, this is one where practice, you know, it may have a, an impact on practice at some companies because it's certainly conceivable that you could have uh, a quarter where you have record uh, performance under the non-GAAP measure, but not under the, the GAAP measure due to a charge or, or something like that. So that that may actually, if that's the case, it, it may uh, actually prevent companies from, from, from calling, referring to the, the non-GAAP measure as record or exceptional. The next one is providing tabular disclosure of non-GAAP financial measures without preceding them with an equally prominent tabular disclosure of the comparable GAAP measure or including the comparable GAAP measure in the same table. Um, and then excluding a quantitative reconciliation with respect to a forward-looking non-GAAP measure in reliance on the unreasonable efforts exception without uh, disclosing that fact and uh, uh, identifying the information that's unavailable and its significance. 
uh, to the extent companies use actually use forward looking forward looking non GAAP measures, they'll have to, you know, make sure that they're they're complying with that and uh, and add an explanation for why providing the uh, the reconciliation would be uh, the quantitative reconciliation would require unreasonable efforts. And then uh, providing discussion and analysis of a non GAAP measure without a similar discussion and analysis of the comparable gap measure in a location with equal or greater prominence. So I think for, for this one, um, the, the takeaway is that, you know, you can't just use equal or greater prominence once and, and satisfy the requirement. Uh, every time you talk about the non-gap measure, you're also going to have to talk about the gap measure and you're not going to be able to have this sort of lopsided presentation. So you could see a situation in an earnings release, for example, where you sort of go into an MDNA type discussion of the of the uh, non-GAAP measure. Now, you know, if you do that, you're going to have to go into a similar discussion of the GAAP measure, even if it's not doesn't seem particularly relevant or, or useful to you. Uh, so that that may you know, depending on the facts, change practice a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I, is that a question? Uh, yes, don't let me interrupt, but I do have a question. To me, one of the most useful disclosures of non-GAAP measures is when you put the non-GAAP measures and you reconcile them in a table with the GAAP measures. And so here, in your second bullet here, you say an equally calm prominent tabular disclosure of comparable gap measures or including the comparable gap measures in the same table. And that's okay. But on the prior slide, I thought it suggested that if you, if you included the, on uh, slide, uh, what was it, 22, you had the bullet point about presenting the non-gap income statements in a table like I, I get the idea of presenting a full income statement of non-GAAP measures, that's bad. But then there's an OR and it says presenting a non-GAAP income statement when reconciling a non-GAAP measure to directly comparable GAAP measures. I wasn't clear if that was good or not good in that sense uh, 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 on slide 22. And now it seems to be like, well, if they're in the same table, that's okay. So to me, like on that particular issue where, where you have the non-GAAP measures, You've got gap measures and you're reconciling them in the same table. Is that okay? So I think this is not really, I'm not sure this is really referring to a reconciliation here. I think this is just sort of saying if you, if you have a table disclosing uh, uh, non-gap measures, you have to have a similar type of disclosure of the, of the gap measure. I think it's like On calling. The same table, but, but what if you have like, well, and again, it's, it's inconsistent, right? Because if you put them side by side, here's gap and non-gap, that's okay. But if you put them side by side and say, and here's all the reconciliations, that's not okay? So I, I think some of the prior SEC comment letters are helpful on this. They really don't like when people present non-gap income statements, like a full non-gap income statement. And so that, just going back, for the benefit of the people that aren't in the room, the, the question was um, effectively th this first example talking about presenting a full income statement of non-GAAP measures or presenting a full non-GAAP income statement when reconciling, um, does, does that really conflict with the later uh, example that says, well, uh, here the second one, uh, providing tablet, tabular disclosure and non-GAAP financial measure uh, without including it in the same table. So kind of to what James was saying, if, if you are showing uh, two, if you're showing a non-GAAP measure in a table, just like actually listing them out, you've got your reconciliation in a different part of the document, uh, but you've got uh, a table that just presents specific financial measures, they're going to want in that table for you to show the GAAP measure in addition to the non-GAAP measure. That, that's what this example here, the second one on this slide, is saying on 23. When you go back to the first one on 22, I think what they're getting at there is they're discouraging people from showing a full non-GAAP 
uh, income statement. And I think part of your question then is, but you have to show the reconciliation, so you're right. showing part of the income statement, right? But I think when people present the reconciliation, they're not showing the, the full income statement. Right, so like one, one of the recent common letters, somebody had in their 10K a, a you know, they, they've got their gas financial statements at the back of the 10K, but in the middle of the 10K, they have a full non gas income statement, and it's not the reconciliation. Um, and, and they caught a comment from the SEC. And that, I think that was actually the I don't recall it off the top of my head, but if, if uh, you get it to me afterwards, I can get it for you. Um, That's uh, yeah, the next slide. Yeah, Going I, on to Texas. I, 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 just before we move off of equal or greater promise, I, I, I'd like to point out that a lot of these are specific examples. So when you're doing your review of the uh, you know, press release, your earnings release, or your 10K or whatever, you, you should look at this and almost as a checklist go through, this is the low hanging fruit that your SEC reviewer, he's gonna be looking at this as well, more likely than not. And th these are the things that you can avoid catching a comment on, as opposed to some of the other you know, nuanced uh, presentations of what are the adjustments that are being made? How are they being made? How are you doing this, again, individually tailored uh, recognition? Is that misleading under 100B? Those are the things where, you know, if, if you're going to spend your chips, you want to spend them there as opposed to on this equal or greater prominence stuff. And, and to James's point, which I think is a great one, there are going to be a lot of people that look at this last example and say, and, and the uh, example of, you know, describing a non gap measure as record performance or exceptional, they're going to say, well, you know, it is record performance, but I don't want to point out that even though I had record adjusted EBITDA, my net income or maybe net loss was not as bright. So. Yeah. Okay, the last uh, section of, the, of our discussion of the new CD&Is is, uh, is the, are the ones related to tax. Um, and the staff said income tax effects on non-GAAP measures should be provided depending on the nature of the measures. Uh, not very fact specific. They gave a little more guidance. If a measure is a liquidity measure that includes income taxes, it might be acceptable to adjust gap taxes to show taxes paid in cash. If the, if the measure is a performance measure, the registrant should include current and deferred income tax expense commensurate with the non-gap measure of profitability. Go ahead. And then they clarified that adjustments to arrive at a non-GAAP measure should not be presented net of tax. Rather, income taxes should be shown as a separate adjustment and clearly explained. Uh, so I would expect to see on reconciliations, uh, uh, you know, a separate line for taxes after each adjustment. And uh, we just wanted to point out that this is a change from prior guidance that permitted showing adjustments net of tax if the tax effect of each item was disclosed parenthetically or in a footnote. Yeah. Some people actually got the comment letter from the SEC and they said, you need to present this in a footnote. And so they started doing that. Well, now the SEC is saying you can't do that anymore. So even if it's because you're presenting it that way because you got the comment, you're gonna have to review it and uh, potentially make that change. All right, let's uh, jump to our uh, conclusions here, uh, and th these are really just, uh, you know, good reminders. Uh, you know, review staff guidance when preparing SEC filings, earnings statements, and registration statements in light of the new CD&Is, and particularly pay attention to the equal or greater prominence examples, avoid using any potentially misleading presentations, and avoid presenting any non-GAAP measures that can be used as a liquidity measure on a per share basis. Uh, also, do a review of the non-GAAP financial measures usefulness and, uh, and reevaluate uh, 
what you disclose about why you're using that measure and how it provides investors with useful information. Uh, some of the the, the uh, SEC's uh, comments uh, in, in public have been that they uh, have a particular distaste for boilerplate explanations of the usefulness of non-GAAP measures. So, so consider uh, taking a fresh look at those and and. Uh, and consider whether they need to be updated. And then finally, uh, just a reminder to be aware of how you're using the non-GAAP measures between periods over time and uh, to make sure that uh, there's a consistency there and, uh, and if you're, if there's, to the extent uh, you're not determining those measures consistently, uh, you're providing an explanation for why not. And, and, and you may have to actually recast the prior measures. Right. I, I think that in particular here, the usefulness and the related disclosure, that's how you can get out in front of whatever the SEC comment you might be receiving on you know, it being misleading or not misleading. If you can explain to the investor, remember you're also explaining to the SEC reviewer uh, and preempting that kind of comment letter, particularly on something like your earnings re release, where you definitely don't want to have to go, but it would be pretty embarrassing if you had to go back out and uh, restate an earnings release. Um, those, those types of things score the points early. Um, um, just a few additional key takeaways for MLPs. It wouldn't be Baker Box if we didn't uh, throw this in here. Um, Adjusted EBITDA, cash available for distribution and distributable cash flow presentation, still permissible, uh, but because these uh, can be used as a liquidity measure, you don't want to present them on a per share basis. Uh, again, they show the ability to generate cash. That's why you're showing them, to show that you can actually uh, meet your distribution. Uh, but you can present your units that are outstanding, as we discussed before. Um, Again, income tax adjustments, those need to be on a separate line. Uh, reconcile your performance measures to net income. Your liquidity measures need to go to cash from operations, cash flow, um, and then your uh, distribution coverage ratio. That, that's a non-GAAP financial measure. So um, non-GAAP measures and investor presentations that are not filed or furnished with the SEC and road shows, they're still subject to your not misleading requirement. So make sure that in those presentations, uh, you feel comfortable with how they're presented. Um, and again, that they're presented consistently across periods and across documents. Um, and then while you're putting together your disclosures, uh, make sure that you're accommodating the prominence guidance. Again, a lot of this is low hanging fruit, so you can get this pretty easily. When you're discussing your CAFT, um, you need to discuss your net income and or cash from operations uh, and headlines of earnings releases you need to present net income before just EBITDA, CAFD, DCF. Uh, in your tables, don't go in bold face adjusted EBITDA uh, unless you're also bold facing net income. Um, a lot of these things apply to regular corporations as well. Um, interestingly, I think at this point, the impact on the forecast back cast is a little unclear. Um, I think uh, the experts here at Baker Botts, Hillary Holmes being one of them, uh, expect registrants will continue to include line items that walk from revenue to net income as they've been doing in the past. Well, that about wraps things up, and we'll take some questions. Yes, sir, Charles. Uh, I've got an earnings call, and the analyst, one analyst on the call says, okay, how much is your cash flow for sure? What do you say? Uh, so you, you're on your earnings call, your cash flow per share. You've already got your units out there. You've already got uh, your cash flow out there. I think we, we don't provide that. We don't provide that measure. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to be the one to say it. But. It seems to me if they're asking for it, it's got to be sort of. 
it, it's funny you mention that. There, there are a lot of things that might be useful or presentations that are useful to an ambassador that the SEC might object to. Um, I, I, I do think that one of the things in here that people should be mindful of is that particularly when looking at the guidance on what is misleading and what is not misleading, those examples, they're, they say they may be misleading, right? They may be misleading. But to your point, um, on the per share uh, guidance, they're saying don't, don't present it that way. Perhaps it seems a little bit disingenuous or uh, conflicting uh, instructions when they say on the uh, per share non-gap liquidity measures, we don't care what you think or what you say about it. It's Yet earlier, you said the basic principle is, you know, management needs to explain why they're using a particular non-GAAP measure. But now you're saying don't. I think on that one, they're saying no matter what you tell us, we don't, we don't think, you know, you should be doing it. Yeah. So for the benefit of the people that are on the uh, webcast, uh, the question was. Um, the SEC says, well, I'm not allowed to present a per share liquidity measure, uh, even if management thinks that it's useful um, or there's particularly good reasons to do or that. The, or they think it's a performance measure. Or They're they calling it a performance measure, measure not a liquidity measure. Uh, and we would said earlier about how uh, explaining the measures are important and how um, avoiding them being misleading is important. I, I think the particular concern, especially if you're making filings with the SEC, is that SEC is telling you how they want the filings to appear. Um, now, uh, there, there may be somebody that misses the boat on the SEC's guidance and winds up filing something like that, and I'll be curious to see if the SEC comments on the presentation, particularly if they might have robust uh, disclosures as to why that um, per share non-GAAP liquidity measure is presented. Uh, but I, I, I do think that, especially with uh, EBITDA and EBIT they, and free cash flow, they were very clear. Now, interestingly, like adjusted EBITDA, to the extent that your adjustments actually really are moving it to a performance measure as opposed to uh, being a liquidity measure, that may uh, move the needle a little bit, but with even die as their. Um, I mean, so some some companies may have legitimate reasons, but for believing that a measure that could also be a liquidity measure is for their company performance measure, and I think we just have to wait. I mean, and see how far the staff you know pushes that. You know. Sure. So. That's that's right. So the, the question was on slide twenty eight we mentioned adjusted EBITDA, CAFTI, DCF, uh, and other measures. Um, are those definitively liquidity measures? Your particular adjustments to uh, a metric may potentially move them into performance measure territory, uh, but I, I definitely think that that's something that you want to go over with your counsel um, and understand that the SEC is going to see, and you're, again, you're, you've got your tabular presentation, it's going to say per share adjusted EBITDA or CAFTI, and that's going to be the first thing that they ask. So that would be one to be ready. And, and as you're going through this process, you want to make sure that you've, you're reviewing why you're presenting these, how you're presenting these, um, you, you've had a thoughtful process. There's an oversight by the audit committee and management on how the calculation is done and what the presentation looks like. And again, why? There, I'm sure there are companies out there that have said, well, you know, we, we actually don't know why we present this particular measure still. It was important to us 
20 years ago, but now it doesn't really matter. Maybe those individual companies might say, we don't need to show this anymore, particularly if it's something that the SEC doesn't like. Um, but again, to, to the public remarks by the SEC, this is a really good time for companies to focus on what they're presenting and why and how um, in the next quarterly disclosures. Pardon me if this is some question. The um, order count uh, in our business, order counts are important, forward looking, um, saying um, how your revenue is going to look in the future, but is that <laughs> order count? Is that uh, considered non gap measure? Is that like unit sales or? Yeah, we're in the title insurance business. It's not a dollar figure, it's an order, it's an order of title insurance. It's not revenue. It's, it's a flow of future that predicts future income to some extent. But is, would that be considered a non gap measure? Sounds more like a business measure to me than, a, than something that's that you get from a financial statement line item and then, you know, or, or it, it, putting something else in or taking something else out, right? In right. The set of the statement, it, it, it's an order. An order comes in and, okay, you got an order and it goes up and down, um, but it, it's not, a, you know, it's not part of the income statement. But, um, it is something that uh, investors in the market is interested in because they want to know how the market's going. It's a predictor. Sort of like, you know, number of contracts that have been awarded to you or, right. or yeah. number of unit sales, but I think those would be, those would not be considered, you know, providing that sort of business information would normally not be considered a non gap measure. Okay. Um, we, we got a call, or excuse me, a question from the webinar audience. Uh, I'll read the question aloud. It says, um, on the last point mentioned about discussion and analysis needing to cover both non-GAAP and GAAP, would that apply during an oral webcast or is that only in the written earnings release? For example, can your oral earnings call only discuss non-GAAP measures if the webcast has a reconciliation? Um, so I think typically what people do in their earnings calls is they rely on a safe harbor uh, exception and it's in the instructions uh, and it's in item 202 of 8K um, and basically the safe harbor provides relief uh, from the 8K filing requirements um, if the disclosure of the non-GAAP financial measures related to the completed quarterly or annual periods uh, it has to be within 48 hours of the related written announcement. Uh, it has to be broadly accessible to the public. Um, and you have to include the reconciliation you on your website, it. so you couldn't discuss non-GAAP measures and not right. uh, not have reconciliations for them. Yeah, exactly. So the the information is going to be available to the investors, and and you've told them where it is available, and it's right there for them. So. Um, Um, another question says, uh, CD&I 103.03 says to reconcile EBITDA to net income. We typically do that for overall entity EBITDA, but not for segment EBITDA because we don't push G&A depreciation, et cetera, down to our segment. So we cannot really reconcile the net income at the segment level. What do you suggest? The segment level, there are actually CNDIs that cover those uh, that discuss uh, what the specific requirements are. There are exceptions for segment level uh, disclosures. Uh, similarly, there are exceptions for MDNA disclosures. So, MDNA disclosures that are required uh, have an exception. I think it's 102.09 uh, is the CNDI that uh, specifically to um, the example is um, in a debt covenant requires you, uh, MDNA requires you in a material credit agreement for a material debt covenant that is material to the financial situation of the company to present some non-GAAP measure. 
as the staff has actually gone and excluded that uh, from certain of the requirements under Reg G and Tinny. Anything else? Could you provide an example of a board looking on gap measure that would be reconciled? Yeah, I think I'm having a hard time looking at one. Board I've, I've seen, I, I can't recall the exact facts, but I've, 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 I've seen them reconciled before, so uh, I can't remember what, what the exact type of measure is, but, but I, I do believe it's, you know, it's something that's possible to do depending on the measure. Right, so the, the, no, it's 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 reconcile. It's doing the same thing. It's reconciling uh, a non-gap measure to a gap measure. Yeah. So it'd be a forward-looking gap okay. measure. Oh, right. okay. I see. Okay. So, so the question is, uh, what's an example of how a forward-looking non-gap measure gets reconciled? The the idea is. Um, you, you take that forward-looking non-gap measure and you reconcile it to a forward-looking gap measure. Now, w remember, this is where that uh, unreasonable efforts exception is. So there, typically, your reconciliation is required to be qu quantitative. So if it's a historical non-gap number, it's got to be quantitative. If it is a forward-looking non-gap measure, um, it's got to be quantitative, except for the unreasonable efforts exception. So if there's a particular information that you can't produce without undue hardship. And so the new CNDIs uh, basically reiterate what the SEC had previously said, which is in that circumstance, you have to tell people that you're missing the information and it's not presented. Uh, and you also have to tell them what the potential significance is of that information and the reconciliation that you're not providing. Um, and so once you get that out there, then your forward-looking uh, non-GAAP measure would be more compliant, at least with that particular C and the I. Seeing as there are no other questions, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming out.